if you're not evolving and the tools aren't evolving, eventually the books are certainly evolving. They're not morons. Like, yes, we could limiting, we could talk about all that, but even besides that, they're going to plug these leaks. They're not going to just let you pick off rogue numbers and, and just print for it. It's just not going to happen. So it's like, what's, what's next? Hey, what's up, everybody? GP13 here. This is a very special, first of its kind episode that we have just decided we're going to release probably on a Monday. And that is because I have with me a very special guest whose interests overlap with mine in the golf arena, uh, but also is a very wise, sharp college basketball um, better as well. So welcome Ben Raza to the show. Thanks for, thanks for joining me. Yeah, man. I'm actually very excited. Great time of the year and, uh, happy to talk a little hoops and a little golf with you. Yeah, for, for sure. And, um, you know, Ben, you, you can give, give an over, you know, an overview of kind of how, how you got here, but I remember, uh, I kind of first came across you on Rick run goods podcast, actually for, for the golf. And every time you came on, you would also mention something about college basketball and I would pay attention in March and I'd be like jotting down notes that you said about like weird uh -huh. teams. Like uh, I think I remember like San Francisco university or something you were on one year, but yeah, why don't you give us a, give us a rundown of, of your gambling history? Sure. Yeah. I mean like, you know, I feel like in, in this little ecosphere, uh, you know, people have a couple of different paths. They either did the, the full fantasy and went to DFS or they come from poker and then maybe they made the transition. I'm, I'm more of the poker side. Uh, I played a lot of poker and then I graduated from college and I was doing finance and like many people, I was pretty miserable. Uh, <laughs> and I was just like, I don't know. And, you know, I had heard about DFS. I wasn't a huge advocate. I was more on this. Like I, I always bet sports growing up and whatnot. I like that. But I did get into DFS and then I started playing really seriously and, and that kind of snowballed. And then I was fortunate enough to kind of start doing some of this with, with stochastic and whatnot. And now with sports betting really, really exploding, which is super exciting. You know, I've been spending a lot of time on that side with Odd Chopper and what we've developed. So, yeah, I guess, I guess a pretty traditional path on a, on a macro view, I, but more in the poker side to the DFS side. And now uh, I feel super at home on the sports betting side. Yeah, for sure. Shout out to all of the the ex poker players yes. holding it down in this industry. Uh, Gotta that's, do it. You know my path, my path as well. And I, I have a affinity. I know we were talking about uh, Phil Galfon released that like Isildur uh, doc or a mini doc on YouTube, and it just like brought uh, we were chatting about it like brought me back to the to the glory days. So those I always days, love man. thinking about those. Yeah, those were were epic days. But you know what? We're like you know I kind of try and remind myself i'm like oh we're in those days now probably for sports betting you know so um you know stop and stop and smell smell the roses it's been crazy you know what the boom's done and clearly like like you said it's i think that you know dfs has kind of ceded to sports betting like officially now you know there's if you look at the the companies like draftkings and fanduel dfs is such a small percent of their overall revenue and it's like sports betting has just absolutely absolutely boomed so and that that's interesting because i think i remember when we were talking about like rick rick's podcast if i think it felt like very dfs heavy um early on and when you would come on like you would talk dfs it's like when did you see that really start to shift um from the conversation you know now i think like almost most contents shifted towards sports betting it definitely has and yeah i think it for me it was always kind of sport by sport and i always felt that golf was more intertwined even at the beginning you know when when you would talk about golf you would reference a guy's outright odds i think pretty seamlessly yep. but when i would do a an nba show or an nfl show the, the the point spread wasn't brought up that often and now obviously it's almost led with that on a lot of shows so yeah i think we started to see a slow trickle, but golf kind of led the way in some regards because it was just always, I think, a pretty heavy 
sport with gambling kind of already integrated in terms of sports betting. Yeah, that that's true because the best way to it, it's hard to like conceptualize um, winning a golf tournament like winning a sporting event because it's sure. like so hard to do. So or winning a, a game. So it's like, yeah, this is like an 100 to one guy. It's crazy. Like he should win, you know, when Keegan wins at the PGA championship, it's like, oh, you know, how unlikely is it? Well, he was, you know, 250 to one or something like that. So it, you're definitely right. Like I think that plus the U, the UK influence where golf is a popular sport um, in the UK where sports betting has like a longer history has, I think, like always – Golf's felt like a gambling, like a, a gambling um, sport from the from the beginning for sure, which is which is wonderful. It's it's a great combination, and uh, you know we. Speaking of golf, I want to talk a little more about golf on this episode because you know that's that's I think where we have our our biggest overlap, and we'll get into March Madness in a second. But I want to discuss a, a tweet that you made. Okay. That I liked, and it was talking about uh, Scotty Scheffler and Rory McIlroy and their performance on par fives at the API. And it was something like Rory was plus one on the par fives, and Scotty was twelve under. Is that right? Insane. Yeah, yeah. Scheffler bogey free, uh, twelve under. At, you know, there were four par fives, so you get sixteen of them. And he's twelve under, and Rory was one over. So thirteen strokes difference between them just truly I, I was stunned when I dug into those numbers and uh, it's it's wild because so uh, some of it comes from Rory dunking three balls in the water on six yes like and Scotty not doing that but I think it, it's interesting because it we're talking about two golfers that like should be close together but like aren't anymore and I, I don't, you know, like I think obviously short term, uh, Scotty just won, but you know, I don't think there's anything that Scotty does that's that much better than Rory, but it just seems like Scotty just is, he just holds it together. Like I think of him like the house, ha- I call him actually me and my, my partner, you know, I bet golf with, we call him the house because he's just like, he exerts his edge just step by step over the course of a tournament. And you look up and suddenly it's, it's, he's just like in second or in third or in first. Whereas like Rory, it feels like it, in any second, it could be impending doom. So how do you just like, how do you, how do you think about those two golfers and how do, you know, are there intangibles that you consider when you're betting them? Yeah. Impending doom that comes right, right at the top <laughs> of the adjectives when I think about Rory lately. Um, no, it's true. I, I, Something I, I, I've always talked about with golf for me is like that philosophy that Scheffler does, I think, better than most right now is that if you beat, you actually have to beat him. Like if yep. someone was going to win uh, at API, they were going to have to go crazy low because he's not going to give you an opening. He's just going to do what he needs to do. Take take those small wins. And if you hunt him down, you hunt him down. And Rory lately it hasn't been in, in my mind a like a scoring issue it, it's not i see flashes of it it's just when you have such a deep talent pool it's really hard to get away with multiple you know I, i'm a ricky foul i'm wearing orange uh not for ricky today but i do have an orange shirt on and, and no one to me blows up more than like ricky is great in little spurts but he, he has a triple it feels like on every round and you can't get by on the tour like that and so it's fascinating with worry but i just I don't, you, you mentioned it. It's a cringe worthy experience right now. Cause you just feel like a blow up is, is lurking at every turn. Yeah. And with Scheffler, you're like, you can turn the TV off, go outside, oh, come back and you, you have no worries. It's like, like, I don't ever think Scheffler is going to do something stupid. I don't think he's, you know, yeah. Will he miss a four foot putt? Of course. But like, it almost doesn't bother me, you know, with him. Whereas like Rory, it's like you turn the TV off, you come back. He was on the leaderboard and you just like completely miss him. You know, or like that that experience where you're sweating PGA and you have the the uh, PGA tour.com leaderboard up and you refresh it and you're like, where'd my guy go? And you're like, yep. maybe he made eagle. Let me scroll up. Not there. Uh-oh. <laughs> like scrolling all the way down. And it just seems like 
Like there's only a few, I felt like Rom was like that where I didn't really, you know, he, he's just so solid. He doesn't do a ton of dumb stuff, but like, it feels like Rory's like, I don't know. I, I've kind of, I've, I've kind of lost a little bit of uh belief in him being in that, in that conversation of the absolute best players in the world, which would be Scheffler to me and maybe Rom. I have no, it's hard to, it's hard to tell with him. It's been, I mean, honestly, API is a perfect example, you know, and it, it wasn't a huge deal, but I, I did, I did pick up some Rory top 20 during that tournament. And, you know, he, he had a really good round on Saturday. I think he started in eighth on Sunday. Yep. If that was Scheffler, I would have counted that money already. I would have went and spent it if I needed to. (laughs) Like, there's just no way Scheffler's starting in eighth and he's finishing in 21st. But Rory, I turn on the TV, he's four over, you know, and ultimately he didn't even get there. And it's just like, that doesn't happen to the top, top tier. You know, they, they climb and even when they don't have it, they hold it together. But lately, and I'm the biggest Rory defender there is, I just, he better be putting on a green jacket in a couple months because I'm running out of it at a times to back him, man. It, it hurts. It, that, me too. I almost named my cat Rory. So it was close. It, well, it didn't end up being it, but, uh, you didn't name him Sheffler, like, did you? No, that, okay, that got shot down by my wife. Yes. Yeah, Scott. I actually did. I, I floated Scotty. I'll be honest. Scotty? Okay. Honest. Fair. But I was, I was trying, I was trying a lot of golf names and the cat's a girl. So I tried like Nelly as well. Um, tried Rose, tried, Birdie, you know, didn't really work. What are you going to do? It's Luna, you know, but, but Rory was floated. I love Rory. And this is said in love to him as someone who's not like super anti Rory because that person's out there, of course, because he's very outspoken. It's just kind of shocking to see, um, such little, uh, conversion on his talent right now because he's doing hard things. He's doing the hard things well, which is like he's hitting it really long and straight and that's super hard to do. And he's still just like, he's, he just feels, it feels like a dud. So, and you know, the shocking thing, data golf released their, um, uh, like pre-tournament, whatever you call it, it's the skill de- decompositions, basically like, you know, it weights the players in the field. Rory is now in the, and this is, we're filming this before the players championship. So if Rory wins the players, I'm deleting this episode, Smart. saving me and Ben's <laughs> reputation, but he's ranked fourth in their pre-tournament skill. And this is a field without, without Rom, but it's, it's Scheffler by mile. And then it's, I think Xander and then Morikawa and then Rory. It's like, I, I think that's wrong, but it's getting hard to uh, – it is getting a little bit hard to – there might be something going on there. And it's like uh, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on handicapping golf. Are you using, you know, data golf? How much of your process is, you know, taking into account more subjective factors? And because I think Roy is such a good example of like where I don't think that um, I think data golf, you know, does a, does a good job, but it's, it's just like, there's something there that's not, not being factored in and you need the context to, to bet on him or bet against him. Yeah. I mean, I, I think part of the reason, and it's an endless debate, we could do a whole show on just this concept, but like one of the reasons I really love golf is I do think there's a little, little element of art and not just science. Like I think there's a lot of unquantifiable variables. And I've said this before, and it's kind of a weird statement. Like I I really do try to quantify the unquantifiable in golf. Mm -hmm. And obviously that's a, a, you know, a fruitless endeavor at times, but I do think there's just so much that goes into it in in the, in shot by shot, round by round, and certainly week by week with it. So of course, you know, there's so many good providers out there that I think is a great baseline, but I'm in my, in the way I go about things, I am willing to say, okay, I'm going to put some spin on it and I can't prove this out, but I'm willing to, to macro buy on a guy for a month. Even if I say it's not happening right now, I believe that he's got the elements and if it connects, I will get paid off with interest. And if it doesn't, I held on a little too long. Yeah. 
that 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 is interesting and it's like when you're macro buying someone i assume it's a lot of like finishing positions outright stuff like yep. that yep because it's like if you're right you get paid really heavily if you're wrong it's not a massive risk and with the you know you really need someone to be you know let's say that they're getting priced as like a 2% guy to win the tournament if they're actually like a 3% guy that's a 50% ROI, you know, and it's not, it's really hard to decide if someone's a 2% or a 3%. That's like, um, so it's like outrights, I think is a great way to attack macro, macro views personally. I mean, you know, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on like what you're making, well, like what your what's your golf bet mix in a standard week? Yeah. So I think that's something we talk about, uh, you know, in, in, in the discord a lot is like, Step one is is figuring out if you've got a player you think might be worth attacking, but that's just one part of it. Like you can apply that the wrong way and you're putting yourself in a pretty rough position, even if the guy is overall a pretty interesting buy. So like for me, as you mentioned with macro buys, I'm trying to fully leverage saying if I'm right and he happens to, if I spike it, I'm getting paid off. If I'm wrong, I'm minimizing my damage as much as mm -hmm. I can because it's so hard there and then you know i coming from dfs where the philosophy has always been tread water and get lucky for a big spike yeah. same with golf in some elements you know the top 20s the matchups some of the more and i know I, you've done some like really sharp work with finding some of these you know correlated spots or or, or new type of props that are out there those are the things that are going to sustain because obviously your expected win is much higher and then it gives me some extra extra ammo to take a shot on some of the, you know, things where the upside is huge, but I know week in and week out, I'm probably going to gutter ball the majority of them. So I try to put a good portfolio of things that I feel pretty good about, whether it's mat matchups or top 20s, top 40s. And then I take my shots with the, the bezes of the world and donate that money back to the books. It's an endless cycle. Yeah, everybody has their guys. Oh my everybody god. Everybody has their guys in golf. I mean, um it can flip. It can flip. I I've certainly not like I have my favorite golfers. Obviously, people I think would would say Tony Finau for me is a is a favorite and that's certainly true, but it's like sometimes uh sometimes, you know, you just you have a you have a lean on a guy that you think they're going to come they're going to be slightly uh more likely to win it doesn't even mean undervalued necessarily it's like slightly more likely to win a tournament because those are different things if you're betting like the outright market and i think it's an important distinction um where you know someone that basically is a higher standard deviation golfer could uh win a tournament more often than somebody who's a little more skilled but has a lower standard de deviation and like that, that exists. So I, I like that outrights you can kind of take advantage of predicting or having a different opinion on someone's skill or on their ceiling, which seems like to be what you're, what you're talking about when you're putting together that por portfolio. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I mean, there's a guy I kind of just always think of him and like cam champ to me. He, yep. he wins more than you would think if you look at his profile. He's missing the cut, you know, week in and week out. And then he win he wins, though. When he gets in contention, he happens to take it down. And some of that might be noise. And then you've got like Steven Yeager, guys who are consistently yep. making cuts and have been really profitable in maybe some lower variance tournaments. But if you're betting him to win, you're returning nothing right. uh, over and over. So I, I think just mixing and matching and is something I've tried to really do more of saying, can I use this guy in one specific area? Cause they don't need to be profitable everywhere. If I can figure out where he's profitable, that's all that I'm really concerned about. I agree. And here there's another, another DM conversation we had where we were on the same thing kind of without knowing it was, and this is what I want to talk about at how important following golf is to betting on it. I don't know if it's more important or less important than other sports since I really don't do other sports, but I think it's super important. And we ended up on the same play that lost all twice, which was Justin Thomas and his three ball versus Gary Woodland, Tiger Woods. Yep. If you follow golf, you know a little bit about 
what happens when Tiger kind of comes back. He's live to withdraw from the tournament at any moment, as long as he hits a tee shot that uh, counts as action on your three ball. And, you know, Gary Woodland, of course, is, you know, coming back from a significant uh, brain surgery. And the, I think his, his baseline was probably a little bit too high, just considering that you're taking rounds from when, you know, he was, he was healthy and this is a significant event. And Justin Thomas lost both of them because he fucking stinks, but we were both <laughs> on that. <laughs> we were because he was hitting it into the fence, um, every hole and somehow they, Tiger ends up withdrawing and, you know, it doesn't even matter because Woodland just laps Thomas. But, you know, that I think was a, was a play that you're going to be on if you're following closely, but it might not pop off the screen at data golf. Definitely. And that's where I, I go back to that art versus science. Like I, there's no doubt I get myself into trouble sometimes where I put too much spin on it and my bias shows and I, I hold on too long, but I, I believe that at the same time, there are plays that you can be led to just by having being able to take the baseline of numbers that don't lie and applying just small tweaks of saying, OK, I, I've seen something, you know, not everything is especially in Florida, not to go on a tangent, but like, you know, you're one inch to the left and you're in the rough and you're one inch to the right and you're in the drink. And yep. sometimes that happens like it's not all the same and you don't want to overrate having seen the shot from one player. But at the same time, I do think you can pick up little things that can give you small edges that add up over time. I agree with that. I've actually, I find it, I don't want to do, I like want to do this and don't want to do this, but if you could, because this is what I've always thought about golf is exactly what you said. And I I think the best example of this is putting. Like if someone hits a, um, let's say someone hits a 20 foot putt and the putt lips in or it lips out. And it hits the same lip, lips in, lips out, 20 foot putt. The lip, the person who lipped in is going to get like 0.9 extra stroke scan putting compared to the person who lipped out. Or someone lips out and it, you know, ends up a foot from the hole. Or they completely wipe it, give it no chance, misses by a foot short, like a foot short right. The person who lift out hit a better putt and those putts are going to be graded the same. So like strokes gain data is amazing, but it's not the be all end all, which is good news. I think for all of us, because it means that there's still um, a lot of areas for improvement that we can do if we like, or think thought, you know, be thoughtful about golf. And if you watch it, you know, you could almost like hand grade a player's round to a better accuracy if you're objective about it than uh, just looking at the stroke scan data at the end. I've always thought that I don't really want to do it, but I've always considered it. Yeah, you should do it. So then you can give it to me so I don't have to do it. Cause yeah, I, yeah. If I, anyone I wants anymore. to do that. No, 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 <laughs> no, no, I don't want to either, but yeah, there are just little things. And yes, over the course of time, everybody's going to have a couple lip in a couple, it all comes out in the wash, but in short term samples, sometimes you're just not getting the breaks and it's like, wow, this guy's ice cold putting. Yeah, but it's not as bad as it seems. And right. are we baking that in too much now? Maybe it is a buy low uh, or vice versa. This guy is just dodging bullets all over the place. You know, he's been on the right side of the draw five straight weeks. Um, you know, little things like that. It's not always baked in and you can you can glean some edges there. Um, speaking of spiking. Scotty switches to the mallet at his rival's suggest- <laughs> suggestion, goes on to lap him and wins. What do you, did you have a, did you have an adjustment on the putter switch? I've, I've always been interested by putter switches and I have some theories, but I'd love to hear what, what you think. Yeah. So it is fascinating. Something I've, I've tossed around a little bit. Um, I kind of put it in, in, not to hedge my bet, I kind of put it into, I like it in the sense it'll up the variance. It could make it worse, yes. could make it better. And I'm I'm willing to maybe embrace it and move somebody up in the sense of, again, when we're talking like outrights versus top 40s. If a guy switches a putter, I'm probably more likely to bet him to win 
than to make the cut because if it good, this could be really good. Uh, and so that's kind of where where I take it. Um, you know, yeah, Scotty, obviously, if he gets that going, it's going to be a big problem for me. Uh, but yeah, that that's kind of my theory on it is that it it could open some doors. That's my my theory too. And I now after this, I mean, I think the most famous example, recent example of a putter switch was Lucas Glover, um, where, you know, it eventually I, I tapped out. I said, I'm done. No <laughs> Take, you know, I lost so much fucking money to Lucas Glover um, when he switched putters. So it's been in my mind since then. I haven't done like a, a comprehensive, uh, like objective study on it because it's hard to tell when non-famous people switch putters and it's hard to tell when people switch putters but they don't go on to win you know two tournaments in a row uh coming from being one of the worst players on tour uh you know when that happens we know lucas glover switch putters but how many times did the number 120th player in the world switch putters and we just didn't know about it so hard to do but i think like what you're saying makes logical sense where at least it could increase the, increase the variance, which is good for outrights or any, you know, it could be good for anything that's high plus odds, because let's say it's a, a, a poor player, but they're switching putters and their top 20 odds might be like plus 900. I don't know. Maybe if their game's not terrible, except for their putter, that's the spot you take them, you know, too. So without, studying it that's my lean um obviously scotty ends up winning so i don't know how much that's coloring my thought process and he did it by putting well which is shocking you know (laughs) we'll see um when i switch putters i feel a little more free for the first couple rounds and then like i get used to it and then i start not putting as well that's my personal experience i don't know you uh do you play golf no, no, no. I, I play little little golf once in a while, but no, I'm a terrible golfer. Uh, but, you know, I think that philosophy in life, though, is pretty applicable. Like you make a change. It's a mental reset for you. You're probably a little more free. And, it, you know, you may see some improvements and then life sets in. And if you're a bad putter, you're probably going to be a, still a bad putter. But I, I think these little things, again, tough to decipher, but it's not nothing. Um, so. I agree. And I think one of the the lines that's really dictated my um my philosophy to golf betting is it's what you're saying it's like uh there there's this this golf better abnormally distributed he's like i would say probably the best golf better and he said there are other things there are other predictive things besides strokes gain simple as that and it's like yes yes I agree with that. Now, what are those? Like, that's for everybody to, to decide and figure out. But for everybody who, and I, it's it's very popular on Twitter now to be like, oh, this is plus EV to data golf. And I still think personally, data golf is the best golf data site. So, and it has the best API. So it's it's very useful. But for everybody who's like, this is plus EV to, to data golf, like, let's all, de- like, re- you, you should know that data golf methodology which is you know basically almost only stroke scan data now there's some uh interesting adjustments they make but uh they're trying to do a really good automated job at pricing golf uh uniformly and the outlier spots are not going to get picked up and that's usually where the biggest value is is in the weird spots so um you know that's my little uh i guess rant for for people on Twitter who are kind of starting to bet golf, but they're only doing it with data golf as the gospel. Like I think we'd both agree that the nuance provides certain opportunities that are big edges that aren't um, accounted for in, you know, numbers like data golf fair value or what, you know, insert other site here. Oh, definitely. Absolutely. I mean, that's my, my whole philosophy is that there's, still uncovered i mean you you summed it up perfectly there are still other things that can be predictive and are not baked in and that's if you can mine some of that you can really uncover things earlier and i'm sure as we're all you know there's a million sites 
all, all, doing all sorts of things. And I think great work is being done in, in just plus EV betting and market-based betting. Certainly, we do it as well at Odd Shopper. But as the industry matures, these edges are going to continue to get eroded and they're going to become public. And then you're going to have to find new edges and, and make it that much harder. So yeah, I'm always trying to think about what's in here. And that's great as a baseline, but what's not in here is I think more important, honestly. Totally. And if I was to give someone more advanced advice on how to get good at golf betting, it's like data golf has their methodology written down in hundreds of pages of blog posts and whatnot. If you're really serious, go read that because like Ben said, what's in there? If you know what's in there, then you know what's not in there. Yeah. But until you understand and figure out what is what is a stroke, you know, what how is a stroke gain calculated, what is involved with those numbers, then if you don't know that, then you won't know how to deviate. It's like GTO and poker, right? It's like you know how to play game theory optimal poker strategy, or at least know what it is, then you know why you deviate and how to deviate. You know, but first, you know, understand the basics. So I, I do, you know, I'm all for it, but you're, you're spot on, like know what's in there. So you know, what's not in there. I love that. Absolutely. It's going to be fascinating, <laughs> man. I, like I said, it's, it's a fun time in general, because I think more and more we are seeing even terms like, you know, just even expected value EVs everywhere. It's on my Twitter. And I think it's probably being thrown around maybe a little too uh, loosely in some arenas, but those concepts are becoming more to the forefront. I think that's overall a good thing. But until, I mean, you just said it, until you have the foundation and the core, you can't deviate because you don't know what you're deviating from. You need to start with the solid, solid metrics and then then make your moves. Because without that, yeah, just like, yeah, just like GTO, uh, you can't make moves without knowing exactly what you're deviating from. Couldn't agree more. Okay, let's quickly touch on EV, and then we got to we got to give the people the what they want. Talk about hoops. I Trojan horsed March golf. I Trojan horsed some golf talk in there on the back of what I'm sure is going to be a March Madness themed thumbnail or something like that. Sure. So uh, for everybody who stuck with us through the golf, thank you. Uh, appreciate appreciate you very much. Finally got to talk a little golf. Um, plus EV betting on Twitter. You're you're it you're right it's it feels like people now like the pendulum swung one way which was like you know computers can't win at sports now it's like the only thing that matters is devigging <laughs> the pinnacle and if you don't devig the pinnacle you're so dumb and you have a gambling problem it's like you know i want it here somewhere um you know i think I think there's been a little shift because it's become too crowded. It's hard to harder to just take the top number off the top of an odd screen um, if everybody's doing it. Uh, and I don't know what, what you think about this, but I do think that you're saying the industry is going to mature in these strategies that are more nuanced, a little more creative, I think will start to become the um, premier winning strategies out of necessity to like edge plugging, uh, uh, like the books plugging the edges or the leaks. I'd love to hear what you think kind of the next year or two looks like for plus EV betting for the Twitter discourse for how to win at sports. You know, what, uh, what are, what are you thinking about when you think about how you're going to win next year? Yeah. And cause that is, that is what's on my mind every day, honestly, cause it's, it's fascinating right now. And you know, I, I think I, I'm a big, obviously, listen, you know, I, I help lead odd shoppers. So you know that sure. I believe in odd screens and I believe in a market-based approach. And I think those tools can really help. I, I strongly advocate for that. But as we talk about in our discord, I don't care what you're doing. Yeah, there are recipes to success, particularly when you're in your infancy to just really leaning on that stuff. But if if you're not evolving and the tools aren't evolving, eventually the books are certainly evolving. They're not morons. Like, yes, we could limiting, we could talk about all that. But even besides that, they're going to plug these leaks. They're not going to just let you pick off rogue numbers and, and just print for it. It's just not going to happen. So it's like, what's 
what's next? You know, the on the other side, you know, bottom up originating, that's obviously a lot more complex for a lot of people. But can you can you combine them? Can you take 80, 20, 90, 10, something yep. like that? And that's that's really where I'm focused, where it's like I still want to get some type of source of truth. But just like golf, almost, can I bring a golf philosophy to college basketball? Where I'm saying, okay, I, I've got a foundation, but now I'm going to put a little spin on it, a little flavor, and I'm going to have a couple edges that I don't think are being incorporated. And now I have an edge that I can scale a little bit, and that's to me. We'll see with you know. I saw you actually just tweet about golf. You know, pick six. There are new formats yeah. that are going to be exploitable. There's no doubt. But between that and just meeting in the middle, that that's really where my focus is, and, and Odd Shoppers' focus is, is being a little ahead of that curve. I love it. I, you're so right on 80, 20, 90, 10. Like I do, that's, I haven't thought about it like that, but that's how I, my recommendation to most people, because if you were to go and be like, I'm going to go out right now and I'm going to build, you know, a fully odd, like almost fully automated model. That's going to like beat NBA point spreads. Like you're not going to do it this year. It will if you start now, maybe you got it by next season if you're really, really diligent. But that doesn't mean that you can't do stuff that I would still consider bottom up that isn't model based, which could be like the Tiger Woods, Justin Thomas three ball situation, or like kind of predicting a certain golfer's um, standard deviation as high and knowing their prices pretty good. And if they have a high standard deviation, then pretty good price plus high standard deviation means outright can't be that bad. You know, something like that. Like there, there's, there's ways to do this that don't involve like a PhD, um, but also get you a little extra juice based on top down strategies, which like you said, you have to have an odds screen, know the market. This is all people who model or you know are originators know the market still you still have to do that and you still regress to the market um so i love you know i think you're spot on and now i know uh you're trying to save the viewers by mentioning march madness college basketball let's get over to it how tell me tell me how you approach um betting on the tournament you know i'm thinking of it in terms of golf so like I, I, and this is someone who's not a sophisticated college basketball better, but this is one of those rare tournaments where you kind of have an outright market and then you have like a, a game by game market, right? So the thing about the tournament that I think is, is pretty fascinating and I'll, I'll try to, maybe I'll translate a little how I see it into golf terms. Like I think it's the element of like, you know, new, new courses in the rotation, you know, these teams, mm -hmm. uh, they're playing in weird arenas against teams they've never heard of. Uh, and then the concept of top 20s versus outrights. There are teams mm. in this tournament, this single elimination, the best team, probably not going to win. Uh, but if you get hot, what, what is the ceiling for certain teams? You know, who's mm -hmm. more likely to run off six straight wins than someone else who's very likely to make the second weekend? but also probably doesn't have six big time performances in them. Uh, so mm -hmm. again, it's, can I take these teams and put them in different buckets? I've got my wild upside. They might go out in round one, but they could also win the whole thing. And I've got teams that I feel pretty good are going to be in the sweet 16, but I also feel equally good. They probably get clipped by the superior teams when we get late. So I, that's my big time philosophy is separate, just like golfers. Can we find the right market for each team? and? I do think I'm at a slight advantage with some of these because I watch a disgusting amount of bad basketball. Uh, like I've seen the Samfords of the world play 15, 20 times uh, as as That's embarrassing wild. as that is to say on a podcast, but it's true. Um, so <laughs> I love stylistically, that. I think you can you can mine some of those and the and the, the lines will move very quickly, but you can get some some good spots on individual games as well. I love this. I have so many questions. OK. Um, not not related to watching a disgusting amount of basketball. I love that. And that's the commitment that you need. I mean, the college basketball people are crazy. That's what I always said, because you have to keep track of 150 teams or something. It, it's 360, just, man. Oh my 360. God. I mean, that's more than the PGA Tour and the European Tour combined in golfers. 
Yeah, like, that's I'm bad. like, oh, the Lemoyne Dolphins. Like, <laughs> where I don't even know. Apparently, that's in New York. Shout out Lemoyne. I uh, don't know that. I'm I, just like you're this from New York. I grew up near there. I don't know what that school is. Create a school, man. It's so many teams, but you know what? It only takes. I watch so much basketball, and ninety-five percent of it is not actionable. But the five percent that I do find that's actionable, it makes the time, like my hourly, I think honestly worth it. And this is another interesting concept because I always like to talk about like, is your edge defense? Uh, yeah, let's call it defensible. So it's like, is my got too excited to hit the mic? Is my edge that I see, you know, green on the? I don't want to keep dumping on data golf. This is not a dump on data golf, but I see green on the data golf screen. I bet it. That is an edge that probably is gonna either go away or not be an edge because everybody sees the same, you know, flash of green. But is everybody watching the Lemoyne Dolphins, you know, play 15 times, you know, a year, you know, against San, you know, playing Sanford. And you were telling me, uh, you know, I was saying I live, you know, in Charleston. You're like, oh, I watched them play Tow- Towson last night. Yeah, Towson. I, like, <laughs> I did not watch that, you know? So like that edge to me is incredibly defensible because the work that, uh, and the, the hours that it takes to put in are significant and people probably aren't, um willing to do that but because people aren't willing to do that then you can get a high, uh, actually like a, a really high hourly from it and it's worth it you know like it's it's it the hard stuff is worth it uh the stuff that's kind of boring is worth it because people don't want to do that it's a protect i view it as i kind of call it a protected edge like yep. that's not going to get wiped away unless someone can package it and quantify it easily and mm-hmm. maybe they can but i think it's very difficult the only way you can really glean all of it is to, to actually put in the time and society's not going to do that i barely want to do it <laughs> uh, and so i i get it and I, I do like i said i can't stress enough you know the you see you see these things and and the you know what what these tools can do and it can spit out a you know Green is good, red is bad, and that's a great starting point. And I, I just preach a lot: don't be a slave to the projections, don't be a slave to anything. You put, get it as a starter, and if if it's if it's working, you can use it as a barometer. But I, I don't think it's ever plug and play. Even if you ultimately are doing that for a time, I think that's okay. But you always want to be aware of what you're doing because if you yes. if you aren't, when your edge disappears, and it will at some point. You're gonna be oh, you're gonna no. be betting into a bad market for quite a while until you realize that oh uh oh this disappeared and now I, I I'm not pivoting fast enough. Exactly. Yeah. It's like I always stress the import. Yeah. You know, everyone's like, well, get a get a small you know get a good p value. It's like, well, by the time that you've gathered a sample that's uh, worthy of having a you know statistically significant p value, you're broke if it's a losing edge. So please try and uh, pre- preempt that by understanding what you're doing and that's the only way to do that so that's spot on um so how do you when you're watching these games like what are you what are you looking for you know for all so the, think, the ball knowers out there who, who are watching this i think a lot of things particularly with college is and it's so granular but it's important like there's tendencies uh, i think one of the one of the things that's really not mind is you only get 5,000 college. And if you get two in the first half, there are a lot of coaches that have a strict philosophy that their guys sitting in. The, you could get 2,000 one minute and that yeah. your player sitting on the bench for 19 minutes in the first half. He's done. Uh, other coaches will play him. Um, first half lines, I don't think are going to particularly live quantify that. Like you're mm-hmm. in the double bonus early little things. So like I know in the tournament, like, okay. I'm going to use, I'm turning this into a Samford Bulldogs podcast. Apologies. Yes. Um, you know, no one on that team plays more than 25 minutes a game. They run basically hockey lines. They run 12 to 15 guys. Fascinating. They press the entire Weird. game. They shoot a lot of threes. What they do is different than a team that has a seven man rotation. And if someone gets two fouls, it may disrupt literally everything that they're doing. Um, you know, so again, just having a profile where I can react, whether it's in game or just stylistically of saying, okay, this in this region, 
all these teams have no, no, you know, their point guards are two freshmen and a sophomore and they're going against a full court press potentially, you know, if you match up with a team like that, that could be something that I look to if it develops like that. And of course, you know, the stats, these numbers are efficient. The, the books know what they're doing. They're going to bake in stuff, but can they bake in things that happen on the fly? Can they bake in coaching tendencies, things of that nature? I think probably not. And I'm willing to say, doesn't mean it's a bet, but I'm ready if it, if the door opens, cause I know mm. exactly what I'm looking for. Yeah. Yeah. That's so this is like, you're kind of, you're, you're interested in live betting a lot of this stuff. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, you see all these, I mean, your, your boys last night, Charleston was dead and buried. Yeah. Um, that they were probably live dogs at one point, they were down seven pretty late. And, uh, I'm not saying I knew they were going to come back, but at the same time, you do get a feel for some of these teams and these games are never over. You can, you can pick off some positions, uh, and it, it helps if you have a, a, a pretty good sense of where the team is at. Are they built to come from behind? Are they built to withstand an early run? And, and it's noisy, I'll admit it, but I do think it's not without some merit. Yeah. Okay. I, I think that's, I mean, that, that would make sense though, because when, when I had Ed Miller on, he was, you know, one of the guys who built those, those live models and he would agree with you. He's like, yeah, like it doesn't factor in coaching tendencies. It doesn't, you know, factor in random, you know, certain, of, of course there might be one switch that says player has two fouls, but it doesn't have a switch that says player has two fouls, coach sits player for the rest of the first half, you know, like, because they don't know that about that coach. There's 360 teams. Like, you can't. And impossible. more markets, as you know, and obviously I shout out Ted Miller. I got his book sitting on the table next to me. Like, the more markets that they put out, it's great for everyone. It's great Twitter, Twitter content. The You think somebody knows about some of these obscure March Madness weird props? And, like, the more they put out, the more they have to defend and the more opportunities we have to maybe find something that's just not not in there and, and we can press it hundred percent. Okay. So now we've kind of got your philosophy on watching basketball. How are we, you know, how are we approaching now judging if a team is a, in your bucket of, you know, high variance could win it could bust out, you know, the first two rounds if they're solid, but, you know, limited upside. How are, how are you judging that in basketball? Like, I actually have no clue. Yeah, I mean, of course, it it is a fascinating tournament, and I do think the draw is is part of it. Um, mm -hmm. I think the easiest things, and again, it's not the end all be all, but the three, just in general, basketball people who know basketball a lot better than me, I'm sure, can speak to it. Just three pointers in general. You know, these teams. There are teams that will are going to say, "I'm going to take 40 of them." And if I make 20, you're going to lose. And if I make yep. eight, we're going to lose by 30. But yep. it's hard to stop a team from saying, let's up the variance. And mm -hmm. I think particularly teams that are getting, you know, these mid-majors are getting smarter. They understand, let's up the variance. Like, mm -hmm. why, why play a team to more possessions? Why, who would want to play a seven-game series against the Celtics if you could play one quarter? I'd rather mm -hmm. play one quarter and say maybe they right. get ice cold and we, we can beat a team that's better than us. Uh, now, I think teams, some teams are built to prevent it, prevent that a little better. You know, if you've got bigs, if you've got ways to marginalize it. But I, I think not to rip on Purdue, who I took a shot on on Twitter already <laughs> before the tournament. Bang, like, bang. I just, I understand the concept of we can get wide open threes. But in early rounds, why exactly do you need to do that? Why, why get into any type of variant situation? Take some layups and make some free throws and, and move on with your life because I think that you're going to see, we always see upsets. And I, I just, I, I really look to the teams that I say, okay, I, I know that they're going to understand how to smooth out variants, whether it's forcing tempo, getting more possessions so they can play to a truer outcome. Or just rotation wise, they have so many different ways to exploit this team. It's gonna be, it's gonna take a minor miracle. Uh, one dimensional teams, I think, may have upside, but they're also more likely to get clipped. So 
it's not a great answer to be honest. Uh, but no, I, I no, that think, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just trying to find that that type of portfolio. Because I'm thinking about like, you know, I'm someone who um, watches March Madness and loves it. I'm not super involved outside of it, but thinking about last year. Like I don't think I've seen a team just like stomp people like oh UConn my. did through the tournament last year, and it's like because it it just didn't it didn't feel like they ever let the game get into a high variance state. You know they knew they were gonna. I don't know. It just I've never seen a, a team walk through the tournament like that. And they weren't. You know I believe I don't have it in front of me. I'm pretty sure they were four seed something like that. They were not yeah. like the one seed. Or, you right, know, who right. was supposed to do that and. I thought not to drill down in the games, you know, the first half against Iona, which was their opening game, shout out to Iona right next to me. Yep. Uh, it was a little high variance and, and I thought they were on the ropes and they settled in, got through it, and then they never looked back. Um, and I, I, I do think just even again, just if I could go back to golf for a second. Yeah, please. You know, there's there's golfers where it's like, I like this guy, but if it starts raining or the wind gets up, or any other thing happens, it's over. And then there's other guys where I say, I don't care what the elements bring. They can handle, they can chameleon their game to handle any adversity within the tournament. And I think it's the same in, in college basketball. There are certain teams that will say, cold shooting, hot shooting, slow pace, fast pace, we can adapt. And other teams say, we need the right conditions or we're absolutely cooked. Yeah, that that's that's spot on. So... When so it's like yeah where they there's it seems like you know UConn from last year is an example of a team that's like gonna adapt or or whatever they call it the Scotty Scheffler of of a basketball team and you know you're gonna have like the Jordan Spieths who are gonna fire and you know either just like absolutely melt down or win and it needs to go right but it can go really really right what do you look for in like when those teams are head to head is it is it more about their variance in a vacuum. I imagine that the matchup styles matter way more, but you know what walk us through like how certain teams match up why a team would match up well or why a team would match up poorly against another team. Yeah, I think that's a, a really important distinction because like the ability to beat a team that you're extremely superior to, I think is a different skill set than being able to beat a team that it's probably like 60, 40 one way. And like, can you make it 70, 30? That's a totally mm. different concept than avoiding the 90, 10, where you should just avoid the blow up. And I, I think really part of it does come down to, to just things that are, you know, coaching and things like that. But to me, when I really look at it, I'll go right back to, to those same concepts. I thought with UConn, even having watched all those games, and I know you said you watched them, what did they really, like, I, I don't get a sense of what they did. It wasn't like, oh my God, this team is the best shooting team I've ever seen. Yeah. Or, oh my God, they, they're so quick. No, right. they just slowly grind you up. Yep. Um, no mistakes, n nothing, no ice mistakes. you out. Uh, and I think that's always, I always try to ask myself a couple questions when I get a matchup. If both teams play their A game, who, who mm. do I think would have the advantage? If both teams play their F game, who do I think would have the advantage? And then what are the chances the team plays an A or F game? Like yeah. how, how likely is it that we roll a ceiling or a floor? And from that, I kind of say, okay, I have a good idea of what could happen and what the likelihood maybe is that we're going to get an extremely good or bad performance from this team. And I'll kind of go off that. And obviously, again, it goes back to what we both said. I'll look at Penny. I'll look at our, you know, on Odd Chopper, where do we have the books? Can I get a number that's in range? Am I close enough to put, you know, if I'm saying, man, I, I think this should be 12 and a half and it's at four. Like, well, obviously I'm probably wrong and I've made a huge yep. mistake. Like if it's at 11 and a half and I have it, you know, okay, I think it should be a point and a half. Now we're close. Like I I'm willing to bet on myself there. And that's where I yes. think, you know, that's, that's close enough where my, my, maybe my little sprinkle of, of art in, in with science can make the difference. You're so spot on with that. That one of my favorite quotes was on this kind of like obscure episode of be better betters with Spanky. And he was interviewing this guy 
Ooh, Jason Scott, I think. From anyway, he ends up being like the head trader at BetMGM. We can, you know, dump on BetMGM, but this, you know, he was an interesting. Uh, he was certainly an interesting guy who had a good background. He worked for this um, famous like horse racing syndicate, and the quote was basically like, "If we have a horse that we, if we price a horse um, that you know at four to one and the market six to one, you know, that's a bet." If we price a horse four to one, the market sixteen to one, we're wrong. You know, it's like the 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 art only can be, I think, the sprinkle, right? Like you said, I love that concept. It's like make sure it's close enough that like you're only making those. You're almost going from a a no bet situation to you know a bet. You know, something pretty close to to EV, and then it's like, well, you know, I think that this. Um, this interesting tendency I've noticed watching their games is actually coming to play a little bit more. As long as you're close enough, then you're probably okay to like sprinkle that art in, but like don't go nuts with it, I think is what, what you're kind of saying. And it's important for people because I think there's a tendency to be like, I know I watch so much basketball, so I actually know all these things are going to happen. Right. And it's like, you're almost trying to fight against that too, which must be difficult in your case as someone who actually watches uh, a lot of games super difficult uh i definitely preach like operate from the gray zone and what i mean by that is like it better be close enough without whatever you're adding that you don't because you know i'm lucky i consider myself a moron so it brings me back to earth pretty quickly uh because like a lot of people no offense to people but they're like yeah I, i know better than the books and it's like no you probably don't. Maybe there's a small, you might have a small edge, but if you're t- like you just said, if you're, and I got, I got pictures of the ponies behind me. Like, yeah, yep. if, if a horse is, you know, that's paramutual, it's totally different, but still like you do not, you know, if, if you're saying a team, if the spread is 10 points off, you have a hundred percent made a calculation, uh, that is off, um, or you're going yacht shopping, but it's probably the <laughs> former. Like, so yeah, I'm, I'm very, like anything, it's a trial and error, but I'm very quick to say, okay, the most likely scenario here is that I've made a mistake, not the book. I want to always err on the side that I'm in in the wrong. And if I keep diligently looking and I say, okay, you know what? I, I feel pretty sound about this. I actually think the book is inaccurate here and we were close to begin with. Now we have something. It, it's It's like a macro bet, it, creating your mindset like that because it if your mindset is I'm right, it's so easy to go go broke. If your mindset is, ooh, I'm probably wrong, I'm not like I'm not the be all end all, then it's really hard to go broke thinking like that. You know, you're not gonna you're not gonna expose yourself repeatedly and unnecessarily to edges that aren't edges. So I think like thinking like that is probably step one to being a successful successful better you know i i don't hear it's interesting talking to people who who win at betting it's like the more the less confident they are the more likely they are a winning better they're like oh this is might be good i think that's probably good whereas like a losing better is like the lock. last five games that's a lock this smacked five out of five he always crushes this you know it's like you're obviously, you know, so it is this like really interesting um, dichotomy between like more confidence equals worse results. Um, of course, be confident in your process and like that you've done the work, but you know, definitely don't don't be confident in something that you really have no basis to be confident in um, at the time. So, spot on. I have to ask for some picks probably because world we live in. Yeah. I'm so like, it doesn't even, it's so funny. Like it doesn't interest me, but um, like all the discussions leading up to it interest me, but I know people, especially for March madness probably want some picks. And actually I kind of do because I'm doing this um, like live Calcutta with Mr. Limited. Um, this guy, I won the money on Twitter, a couple other people, uh, and I don't know anything about March Madness, so this is going to be, could you educate me and who who I should be looking to as a, a cheap buy in a Calcutta, maybe? 
So, yeah, I mean, you got UConn, Houston, and Purdue, I think everyone says are the best three, and I, I it's hard to argue with that. Purdue, you know, I think in brackets, the game theory aspect, it's like, oh, well, they're going to lose. And it's like, yeah, everyone says that until – Tony Finau couldn't win until he won. Um, yep. Like, it, yeah, maybe they go out early or maybe they don't. But I give you two teams – that, you know, they're not from the clouds, but I think they're in the next tier. I have positions on them, picked up futures throughout the year. And it's Marquette is one, okay. and Illinois is the other. And and the thing they, I think, both have in common, and it's what we talked about. One, they're not built to win any sort of way. They can make threes if they have to. They can play inside if they have to. They don't play particularly fast or slow. Um, they both have experience in the backcourt. Now, Marquette's a little banged up, and make sure that Tyler Kolick is fine. He's got an oblique, but I'm sure he'll be good for the tournament. Illinois' best player was in some legal issues, but he was reinstated and he's been playing. So I look at those type of teams and there they're are those like two, three, four seeds. Kind of they fit that UConn profile where can they get on that run? Are they reliant on any one thing? I think that's something I didn't mention earlier to you that I think is important. If you're relying on anything to an extreme degree, it's hard to win six, you know, Mm -hmm. saying we're only going to win by shooting threes. We're only going to win by whatever it is. But if you say, "Eh, you know, 15% this, 20% this, 10% this is our profile. It it adds up to a really robust, very anti-fragile type of like portfolio. And that's huge. So, and I think those two teams uh, are it. And then if you want to really donate your money. Yep. I'm looking to do that. That's well, that's what I'm here for, my man. St. Mary's, I was so high on them coming into the year, and they were so bad early. And now they've started to find it. And yes, them and Gonzaga, as we film this, it'll be already done, their third clash. Uh, okay. That's a type of team. You know, they're not going to be a high seed, and but they've got something. And they, they play very methodical. They're, they're a weird, awkward style. They've got a really good point guard and they can make timely threes. I, I think they're the type of team that at any given time, we've seen them lose to inferior competition, but you wouldn't want to play a team like that. It's a pesky, annoying out. Mm. And that's the type of thing we saw FAU last yeah. year, San Diego State, those type of teams, they almost got knocked out in the first round. Uh, actually, you know, Charleston types, there you go. Um, but they didn't. And then they started to gain that confidence. And I think uh, St. Mary's is that type of team. If they get going, they could actually get in the mix just like Gonzaga could from that same conference. Yeah, that's interesting about them playing poorly early on and playing well later. Because that does have an impact on seeding, right? So like you could be... Um, what wasn't like UConn last year? They came in as they were at one point like early on the best team or like number one, and then they might have had like injuries, and then they kind of come into the tournament a little bit of an afterthought, but healthy or something like that. But it's like, how does the flow of the season? Uh, how how did they get there, and where are they now? Right? Like, I think that's interesting. Yeah. It's a huge thing because you don't have to be the best team, or you know, it's not like soccer where it's a table and your first yep. game matters as much as your last game you only have to be the best at the right time and there's a couple of teams that i do think have optimized not intentionally but they've optimized themselves to be playing their best at the right time and i think saint mary's is more that than they they had to work some things out early in the year and they found who they are and if you just took a snapshot of the last couple months you would get a far different hierarchy than if you took a snapshot of the entire year. And I think just mm-hmm. like golf or anything else, I'm a little more, I'm going to weigh some of my recent results maybe that I think are more actionable to a given course now than what they did, you know, in 2018 uh, at the same event when it, things could be a lot different, a lot noisier. So uh, I, I do think that's a really good call out that teams evolve and they're not the same team from start to finish. Do you think it's more so in college because so many good players are freshmen? So it's like, you know, and we haven't seen them. They haven't played in the system. They haven't gotten time to practice like game situations with their players and the teams kind of turn over. You know, I know 
you know, some there's certain teams that are always good, but it doesn't mean they're the same team. Like even UConn this year is not the same as, you know, UConn last year. They, they lost a lot of key players, even though they're still, you know, one of the top seeds. So it's like early in the year probably means even less in college than it does the NBA. Is that Definitely. And the one not, thing I've yeah. spent, I'm going to try to deep dive if I ever get time. I don't think anyone's figured out the transfer portal yet. Talk about new. Mm. You can yep. transfer without sitting out. So teams, it's like, oh my God, they lost 85% of their production. And it's like, yeah, they brought in six experienced transfers who have never played together. When they gel, this team's going to be nasty. But early in right. the year, they're lost because they're all really good players who were the alpha on little schools. Mm. And they all went to UConn, say, and now they're they're trying to fit together. So I think freshman transfers who are you now in March versus who you were on Thanksgiving is a far cry. I kind of love that. It just like, it really makes it almost impossible for the, the sports books to, they don't know. to price these teams even late in the season. Um, whereas like you have so many more known quantities in the NBA, be it teams that have, you know, the majority of them have stayed the same. you know, over the year or just players that you kind of, they're paid to play a role. You plug them into that role and the, their next team and they're kind of good at it. It's very professionalized uh, operation. The NBA where college feels like this, just absolute free for all. Um, I I love it. I love it. I'm pumped. I'm pumped. Okay. So we got, so, okay. So I'm picking St. Mary's at any cost. That's what I've heard (laughs) from this. Any cost. Um, and then we're going with Illinois and we're going with Marquette. I like it. Um, any, well, I guess we don't have the bracket, so we can't speculate on, uh, on first round matchups, but, um, I'm sure, I think you're going to be putting out, I imagine some, a significant amount of content in the upcoming week that will include some of these first round matchups. No doubt about it. We talk a little bracket, but also the bets. Uh, I think there will be, um, and you know, again, I'm, I'm someone that we, I wish we could talk for three hours on, on just the industry and everything. Like, I don't think just giving out picks is evil by any stretch. I don't think that just using an odd screen is, I think it's all has to just match with what you're trying to get out of it. And as long as, as long as the person is, is filling that void. I think it's great. And I'll certainly, I have some fun. I'll be walking around outside dropping. Oh, I love your picks. outside picks. Uh, so getting, what, getting the, tell me yeah. where, why you start. I know you went on a heater when you first went outside. <laughs> so I remember that and it's kind of stayed from there, but what was the, the impetus for that? That's a really good question. Uh, honestly, I was like, you know, shorts are in the content sphere, like really, really popular right now. And so we were doing them and I was just like, I was sitting in this very chair as I do all day. And I was just like, I, this is just like, so I can't do that. Like, I can't film a 40 second thing. It's driving me nuts. And uh, I was talking with my girlfriend and she's just like, just, why don't you just walk? Like just walk and talk. I love it. I was just like, honestly, that sounds, and I did it. And then I posted it. And I did one for the Kentucky Derby of all things. And people were, I mean, naturally you get like a hundred people who are just like, you are, you've disgraced society. Don't ever go outside again. <laughs> but everyone else was very nice and, and people seem to love it. Uh, and so it's just kind of a funny thing now. And, you know, listen, you're giving out one pick on a Saturday with 150 games. Like, you know, it's fun. Uh, I, I, I like it. And yeah, I do enjoy that stuff. I, I like I like dropping some of that, even though I do I I really adhere to all the great work you're doing in your Discord of of teaching a process and and allowing people to be able to really pick up on things and build their own methodology, and not just be fed strictly picks all the time if that's what they want to learn. Yeah, I but I see the thing. Like I like giving out like some golf plays in my Discord yeah. for free, and people are like, "Can I?" Can I buy your picks? I'm like, no, but I will randomly give some free ones just because that's fun. Like it's more, you know, it's like if I were to sell my, my golf plays, they would cost too much money, I think. So it wouldn't make sense, but giving some plays out, letting people have a sweat, like that stuff's fun. And there's certainly a lack of, um, a lack of fun, sharp 
content. It's something I talked to Elf about. Um, there's certainly the, uh, one extreme of that, of, of, of being, you know, really taking it to the next level energy wise and streaming every day and, you know, whatever having, I think he had some porn stars on his stream, you know, you know, so, you know, he's, he's, he's making it, he's making it intriguing. Um, but you know, there's other ways to do that. But I, I love the giving, I, I actually think giving out picks is, is fun. You know, because what are we, what are we here for? Hopefully to make money, but like there's other ways to make money. So, you know, got to have some fun as well. I'm curious, since you made that video, has it changed your opinion on the content or had, since you started to do that, because you clearly like decided to stick, stick with it. Has it changed your opinion on um, content, like sharp twitter content or square twitter content or you know like um you know i'm I'm curious to hear what you think about the just content industry in in general yeah it's like i'm it's always very fascinating to me just like on an individual level just because i i consider myself like a pretty private person i'm not i don't really like to be out there i'm not uh, i i'm pretty conservative i don't if I have a really good day, you're less likely to hear about it than if I have a really shitty day. Like, I think it's easier to make fun of yourself in this. You have to, you have to have, yes. uh, you have to laugh it off. There's going to be giant ebbs and flows where I'm like, I actually lost my edge permanently. And then I didn't shocker. Um, but I, I think for us and, and we, we, I don't want to say struggle with it, but we were trying to decide like, what do we want to offer on odd shopper? And ultimately we decided to put everything together because there's a lot of people that do want to hear, hey, who are you betting in this game? And I think it is valuable to give them that insight. But we wanted them to have the tools and the process and all that stuff that I think ultimately in the long term is more valuable. But without maybe marrying them together, we may never get some people from A to B. And I think as long as you are like anything in life, not to go on a tangent, like if you're upfront with what you're doing, I really have no problem no matter what you're pushing on Twitter, I, I think where it gets murky is I obviously don't love to see some people and saying, you know, we were hitting 90%. And it's like, yeah, well, the minus 830s that you didn't mention uh, <laughs> yeah. might skew that win percentage. You know, that stuff for, for people who don't know any better, that's a terrible way to get it, your first experience into sports betting. But I think it's fun. And giving out picks, uh, I think a lot of people bring great info and we need more of that in the industry because at the end of the day, like you said, we're all working together and trying to have fun with it because it's it's when it's good, it's great. It's such a fun yeah. fun industry to work in, and when it's toxic, it's pretty bad. But uh, we want we want more of more of that. And I know we're a small part of that puzzle, but we're trying to be one of the better pieces, as are you, obviously for sure. Yeah, spot on. Yeah, it's like um, I I agree, and I feel like I I, I think. I think I've like planted my flag in this industry. Like I'm here. So I want it to be a good industry ultimately. So like um, whatever that is, like if people like to have content where people share picks, like I'm not going to, I'm not going to dump, dump on them. It's like you said, if it's, if it's obviously you're trying to take advantage of somebody just like on the other side of the counter when, you know, sports books, I think, um do certain things that are shady and this is not limiting people but this is like more obvious shady stuff like that's bad and if sports books play by the rules and great like let's you know let's grow this thing together so no doubt that people need that i think need that content and i consume that content i mean i saw you originally on rick Runga, like rick's a show where you know, he, he's going to give out his plays for the week, break it down. It's something I don't, I don't do, but like, you know, I, I watch, you know, Rick, I watch, uh, listen to Andy Locke. I think he does a lot of good stuff for, for golf. And, you know, he gives out course breakdowns, but he'll give out some of his plays. And like, this is all interesting content and you get good information from these shows that give out picks because people tell you their thought process. And sometimes something sticks, um, that's, more sports specific than maybe the content I create, which is more, which is broader, maybe like more general gambling, general sports betting stuff. So I think it all, all fits. Oh, it's definitely a puzzle. And it's just, you know, we've, 
and I'm sure you've probably thought about this too, we, we're really trying to take what's the most fun. To me, I think everyone enjoys giving out picks, sweating the games, but to what's the most useful? Process, learning, the education side. We don't, want to, we don't want you to feel like you're in school. We want you to have fun with it, but can we, can we give you some stuff that we really believe in is, hey, here, here's why this is priced like this. Here's you know, the education side of it. Can it be fun though? Um, and, and that's something we're all about. And I'm excited for where we're all going. I, I think it's going to be a big year for the industry and I'm encouraged. And uh, after Marquette wins, we're going to be on easy street. We're not going to have to worry about any of this. So. Uh, we got two I outs for us. I, I can't wait for Marquette. Marquette Round one. This uh, no, on. no. This this podcast is officially backing Marquette. He heard right. it from Ben because I don't know anything. So I'm in. I'm gonna be. I'm gonna be buying Marquette at all costs in this Calcutta, and we're gonna ride them to a victory. And if they win, then I'll I'll do something. I don't know what it'll be, but I'll do something. Um, but yeah, thank you again for coming on. This was a blast. I loved honestly, uh, talking everything, everything golf related, everything basketball related. I think you did a good job of helping me understand basketball and golf terms or more general terms. I, I'm now excited for the tournament, probably too excited. And I'm probably going to find some edges that don't exist and bet on those. But, um, everybody check out what Ben, Ben does. I'm going to, try and push this out Monday. Ben is going to be, you know, heavily invested in the, in the tournament, um, then the rest of this week. So if you're looking to, to get some insight on the brackets or some, you know, high variance teams that could spike a win or spike a final four appearance, head over. I'll, I'll give all the appropriate links for you. I know you have the odd shopper YouTube, um, then you have, you know, of course, your personal Twitter, and you know, we'll, we'll put all your links there. Everybody, give Ben a follow. Let's let's win some money on on March Madness, or at least have fun together, sweating it. Uh, and yeah, thanks again, man. Thank you, man. It was a blast. We'll talk soon.